Hello everybody and welcome to this session, this webinar uh, brought to you by the Fashion Network in association with the Department of in International Trade and the UK Export Academy. Uh, the topic of today's webinar is uh, yeah, Fashion Exporting, a Beginner's Guide. Uh, this is an ideal listening session for small to medium sized enterprises looking to develop a successful strategy as well as a more established business wanting to uh, or people just wanting to brush up and the knowledge in general. So as with all of the TFN sessions, uh, we like to keep these things as interactive as possible. So if you have any questions or comments, then please leave them in the chat box. You should be able to see that at the bottom of your screen. Um, the alternatively, if you would prefer to speak rather than type, what you can do is you can actually click on the raise your hand feature and that will allow us to switch your audio on and you'll be able to speak to us directly. So you've got two options there. You can either leave um, questions and comments in the chat box or you can put your hand uh, up and we'll be able to talk to you directly. Just a word of warning though, we do record these sessions and we then publish it on our YouTube channel at a later date. So. If you do ask a question, then uh, your voice will be recorded on that, um, which uh, for some of you might be useful because you might want to listen on this again, or perhaps you might want to share this with a colleague or a line manager or someone like that. Um, finally, uh, I just want to let you all know that immediately after this session, we normally have a bit of a debrief um, in a separate Zoom meeting for about 15 to 20 minutes. So, uh, and we, we will share a link in the chat box. So if anybody in the audience wants to come and join us, they'll be able to chat with myself and my uh, colleagues at the Fashion Network and some of our panelists will be there as well. So you're more than welcome to join us uh, at that. That will start at 3 p.m. Uh, local time here, UTC. Um, and we'll have about 15 to 20 minutes. What would be useful for us and all of our panelists now though, is if you can just let us know in the chat box, just check with my colleague Mia that the chat box is working. Um, if you could just let us know uh, where you're from in the world and what it is that you do. So please let us know uh, where you're from in the world and what it is that you do in that chat box. Um, while you're doing that, I'm just going to ask my colleague to uh, bring up the next slide. And I'd just like to thank, um, uh, the Department for International Trade's Export Academy program for supporting this session. Um, I'm going to introduce you to Irina, who's just going to give you a little bit of information about the Export Academy. Irina, over to you. Thank you very much, Dale, and good day, everybody. Uh, thank you for joining us today for this session. Thank you to Fashion Network for bringing this uh, event together. Um, I don't think I need to preach to the converted here. I suppose since you are here at this event about exporting, you already know that exporting is important. Um, and we know that exporting organizations, businesses are more profitable, more efficient, and more sustainable. Uh, they have to overcome some trade barriers. They are more suited uh, to overcome any sort of um, obstacles um, because they, they develop better processes in place. Unfortunately, it's fewer than one in 10 uh, UK companies uh, that export and therefore companies require skills, they require knowledge uh, in order to be able to sell their uh, goods and services overseas. So this is where Expert Academy comes in um, and we started as a successful uh, regional pilot about two years ago. Um, now we are a nationwide program. Uh, we are available for any UK company um, sort of um, across UK and it's free of charge. Uh, so we help companies to understand uh, the practicalities of exporting. We help companies to uh, find the markets. We help them to find opportunities overseas. Basically, we are a, a training platform uh, which connects um, all the support which is available um, through DIT, which is Department for International Trade, the organization we work for. Um, and these are events, um, educational resources, uh, which allow you to get that knowledge, to get that expertise and feel more conf confident as you are looking at international markets. So just a few words what the, uh, the program, uh, uh, whom the program is designed for. So mainly that is uh, new exporters or novice exporters, as we call them, um, ad hoc um, 
uh, export is probably you've exported in the past, you reacted to some kind of inquiry, but you don't really have any system in place and you would like to find a more strategic approach to exporting. So this program is well suited for that as well. We uh, see a lot of experienced existing exporting companies uh, on this program as well. Uh, companies send their staff for more upskilling um, and they just wish to brush up their knowledge, brush up their, their skills. We are not exclusive or prescriptive in any way, so we get companies um, of all sorts of turnover of different sizes. Uh, we currently have about 14,000 registrants uh, on the program, which is fantastic. Uh, and it's, it's a free program as well. The core offer of Expert Academy is uh, 10 um, online uh, modules, foundation course, as we call it. We also run master classes. You can see the examples of, of the events on the slide. Uh, we also organize quite a lot of partner events. We work with companies like Amazon, eBay, um, and those partners, those companies can share their business insights uh, with you as well. And generally speaking, exporting is such a vast topic. We uh, sometimes get companies who come on our uh, course and they say, can I just find out about, you know, in terms uh, or what, what is my commodity code or would my goods be uh, controlled if I export to such and such country? And this is understandable because at that point, this could could be the most important thing they need to know. But at the same time, we uh, know something about exporting. We think we need to learn something, but then there is a, a great vast area of things which you know you might not be even aware of. And you know this this course will give you that better uh, grounding on the subject and will give you more uh, confidence as you uh, get involved in international trade. So if you think that exporting is something you are prepared to do, if you want to start doing uh, uh, exporting, or if you exported in the past, but you are not quite sure if you're doing this correctly, if you want some more systematic approach to that, all you need to do is just sign up uh, to our course. You can see the link on the slide, and then you can pick up and you can choose that content which might be appropriate for you. Um, and you can just come back to it from time to time. We add uh, more events on almost weekly basis so you can just uh, come back and check and make uh, the most out of your program really. Uh, so just to conclude, yeah, my, my little speech, Expert Academy uh, is here to help you. We hope that it could be your stepping stone uh, in uh, sort of your expert venture uh, and uh, it will help you to understand as well what help is available uh, via Department for International Trade. Thank you so much. I'm happy to take more questions about this course later. Thank you. Thank you, Irina. And I was going to ask if you've got that link to hand do you want to just copy and paste it in the chat box so absolutely so easy. yeah yeah we will we'll also um in. we will also share this around to everybody that's registered for this webinar and on the youtube link we can include it at the bottom of that so people can register that so there you go guys so if you are a uk business and you need support um on your journey with exporting then the uh, export academy there is uh, there to help uh, thank you very much to Irina, who you've just met. Joining Irina, who's also who's one of our speakers today, is her colleague Emily Lambert, uh, who's also part of UK, UK Export Academy. Uh, she's also an award-winning public speaker um, and uh, with the group Toastmasters International. Uh, alongside Emily is Simon Taylor, who's a non-executive director, investor and retail business consultant, working with a variety of brands such as Osprey's London, uh, City Chic, uh, Lily, and has also worked as a head of international partners previously in the past at New Look. Uh, alongside Simon, we have Laura Ward. And Laura is founder of Exiat, uh, the UK's most exported luxury tennis apparel brand. And she's promised me some, what have you promised me, Laura, some, some skirts to try out? I do. Yes, some tennis dress on. <laughs> some tennis <laughs> dress. And we were meant to have Paul Algo uh, from UKFT. Now, just before this session, Paul uh, Paul's office got evacuated because it was a gas thing. And here he comes. Welcome back, Paul. So Paul will be uh, joining us. He's from UKFT, which is UK Fashion and Textiles Association. So we've got a really good uh, panel here. Uh, so we hope to give you some really useful and valuable insights to uh, how to start your journey on exporting. Um, my colleague Mia is just going to put, put up a poll actually, if you can um, do that for us Mia, uh, and then we'll just get uh, an idea. So the, the question is, how experienced are you in exporting? So 
we'll let you guys just fill that out. Are you experienced, kind of experienced or not at all? So if you can fill that out, that would be great. Uh, and what we'll do is we'll just, while that's happening, we'll crack on with our first question. So um, I'm going to come to you, Emily, first, if that's OK. So let us know, um, when when are you ready to start exporting? What, what stage should a business really consider, uh, you know, making that step? Well, I think that's a really, really good question, and it's never going to be the same in every in every company. Um, we we would say you want to make sure that you can keep up with demand. That's going to be the first and foremost thing. If you are struggling to keep up with your domestic sales, you're never going to be um, in a position to start exporting. That said, you do get some companies who um, see that there are uh, you know, thicker profit margins in, in their exports versus their domestic sales. So maybe they, they try and pivot their business away from um, domestic sales because it's just more in, their, more in their interest to cater to a US market, for example. So um, I was working with one lady who made sort of plus size um, uh, um, uh, sort of fashion items, really, really high end. Um, and she thought that there was a much better sort of market opportunity in the States than there would be in the UK. So for her, maybe it makes sense to get started exporting a little bit earlier than it might for um, for a company that's um, already struggling with, with demand. Um, you definitely, definitely need to make sure that you've got enough time to start um, exporting or that you are able to carve out time to do your homework. And it's something that we stress again and again and again in the Export Academy. If, if you don't carve out that time to do your homework, to figure out what can go wrong, how you can stop it in advance, how you can um, take advantage of opportunities, um, covering yourself um, legally, making sure you understand things like intellectual property. If you don't make the time for that, then just don't, don't, even, don't even bother. Um, and then I think there are steps that every single company can take to make sure that you are in as as fit a shape as you can be before before you make that commitment to um, to export. And that's something that we're designed to do at the Export Academy is to talk you through that. Um, in our very first module, we do something called health checking your business, where we're asking you asking you questions. Have you thought about this? Have you thought about that? Um, and then uh, from from that from that point, um, you can sort of tighten up what you're doing, fix a strategy and, and pursue some, some overseas sales. Well, thanks, Emily. Laura, I'm gonna come to you next, if that's okay. What, what um, oh, here we go, we've got our poll here. So um, at the moment, the guys in the audience, 88% uh, 80, say not at all experienced, 13% uh, are experienced. So hopefully we'll be able to share some useful uh, insights for them. Laura, tell us about your journey. When did you start? Um, uh, exporting and what stage was that? Sure. So, so worth mentioning. So, our brand exit, a very proud Export Academy alumni. Um, uh, and today, 80% of our business comes from export. Um, so it is it is a, a core, core part of our of our model and what we do. And I don't think we would have been able to hit that 80% as, as quickly as we have done without having graduated from the Export Academy. So I, I do encourage those 88% on the call, if you are interested in exporting, definitely straight after this, do, do sign up for the Academy because it's well worth it. But where we began on our journey, as you mentioned, we are a luxury tennis apparel brand. Um, when we launched, so we launched a couple of years ago, we were fortunate enough um, to receive a lot of launch press, um, in it was it was English launch press, but it ran in international titles. So places like Vanity Fair, um, uh, the Financial Times, and Vogue. And what you find with that sort of press is it gets syndicated across their titles globally. Um, so when we launched our first sales, which were generated off the back of that PR didn't come solely from the UK. The majority of them came from overseas. So we had sales coming in from uh, to, to, through to our website, so our, our D2C website, um, from South Korea, uh, from Australia, from Germany, and from the USA, which was amazingly exciting at launch. But it presented an immediate problem, which was that we had no idea how to export. We had no clue what an inco term was um 
uh, what the import duties would be, sort of what the most cost efficient way to actually get our goods um, into these markets um, uh, was. So at, at that point, we very, very quickly, thankfully, connected with the Department for International Trade did the Export Academy, which immediately upskilled us. I call it, and I hope I hope this doesn't offend Emily, who took us who took us through this, but I sort of refer to it as, as export for dummies because we were complete dummies. Um, but it took took us all the way through to you know sort of more more export experts, if you will. Um, and uh, and yeah, it it allowed us to, to to grow our business and immediately capitalize on those that flurry of international sales, but turn that into a cohesive. Um, uh, international exporting strategy, um, which, as I said, makes up 80% of our business today. So it sounds like you were presented with the opportunities and you reacted with that. Does that be fair to say? Yes, yes, that's certainly fair to say. Um, but we, the, the benefit, you know, you anyone can sort of get a few sales in, in, you know, across a few markets. That's kind of easy. It's then sustaining those, and it's then sort of turning it into a into a strategy. And actually, as I mentioned, we got sales across multiple markets. And initially, we were trying to market our brand direct to customers across, um, you know, sort of five markets at once, which which resulted in us taking sort of an already tiny marketing budget and splitting it five ways, making it even smaller. Um, but one thing we were taught on the Export Academy was just to focus on one market at a time. So it was when we decided to focus initially on the US and put all of our budget, all of our in international resource to the US that we really then started to, to, to move the dial and see those consistent sales come in. Simon, I'm going to bring you in on this, if that's OK. Um, tell us a little bit about how you spot market. Obviously, you've worked with a lot of the big boys on this. How do you go about spotting market opportunities? I imagine it'd be a little bit different for some of the clients that you work with. Well, I mean, I've, I've been around for a long time, right? I'm, I'm, I'm a couple of grey hairs in this beard at the <laughs> moment. So, um, you know, I, I, I've lived in the Middle East. I've lived in Southeast Asia. I've lived in Paris. Um, in the early days of my international career, I used to work with, uh, I think it was UK Trade back then, but it's now DIT. Um, so, you know, they were really helpful in some markets, um, especially Southeast Asia, I remember, very early in my career. Um, but through through all of those sort of um, conversations, my, you know, my own black book of international opportunities globally is 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 quite sort of large really so you know word of mouth um talking to people that i know i've known for years out in different markets be it australia or the us or middle east um you know bad 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 news travels so you know you, you know there's good partners out there there's bad partners um you know and, and you, you have to be you know kind of careful who you choose that you want to work with for a whole variety of reasons really um, but I think you know I think in certainly in the early days of anybody's um, you know international approach to a market you know working with DIT or people out in markets is is pretty valuable really they can give you some some pretty good introductions in the early days um, I think em Emily Emily touched on it a little bit um, for me be, before before what is key is before you get to the whole you know inca terms and where we're going to send it to for me there's there's like a list of non-negotiables um that aren't always not all of them are that costly to sort out and you know find out about your trademark in the markets that you want to go into is vital it's not overly expensive and it's definitely a worthwhile investment um, and that can also include your domain names if you're thinking to go online in these markets. Very, very, you know, going to GoDaddy, you can, it can cost you anything from ten pounds to a thousand pounds to register your domain name. So it's it's not a massive investment. Um, and we touched, I think Laura touched on it as well. You know, um, country of origin, product testing. You know, if you decide that you want to go into the US, for example, you know. Um, there's some places where you can get your apparel made that are duty free into the US, for example. So it's it's all it's all about kind of moving the pieces around the chessboard. Um, they're kind of the non-negotiables for me before 
you know, you, you kind of jump into like which Inca terms are right for you. Um, it's kind of like those, those lists of three or four non-negotiables that you need to, you need to focus on really. Thanks, Simon. Um, before I move on to my next question, I've just spotted the question in the chat box here. I think this is to you, Laura. Uh, well, it says, hello, Laura. So I'm assuming that's you. <laughs> um, what difference did you find in the UK and the US markets in terms of acceptance uh, in consumer and competition that you faced or any other major differences that you really felt? Could you share some light on that? Yeah, so that is a that's a brilliant question, and I think it always plays into what Simon was 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 mentioning about when you're thinking about what markets to focus on and and sort sort of how you assess how easy it's going to be win how easy it will be to sort of win in that market. So the great thing about the US is obviously there are a lot of cultural similarities um, between us, and we're both English speaking, um, which makes it a very easy market um, in, in some respects, certainly when it comes to reusing things like advertising assets that you'd already developed for the UK, you can generally just run them again in the US. Um, so there's a cost saving there. But in terms of the, the difference that we noticed as a luxury tennis brand, um, was that a US customer, because we are an, an English brand, um, and as I said, we sort of operate in tennis, which is renowned worldwide for obviously the Wimbledon tournament. So there's this really strong association with, um, with, with, with England and tennis. It, it made us, I'd say, even more appealing um, to, to a US audience potentially um, uh, than, than the UK. Um, so actually it was, as, as a British brand, we were sort of even more appealing to a US audience. Um, and I'm just trying to think if, if there was sort of anything anything that we found tricky. Um, I mean, really, there, we we have to take into consideration things. So obviously, we're speaking to a, you know we're talking about fashion. So th obviously, there are sizing differences in the US. So we've had to adapt some of our our styles to accommodate for that. Um, but other than that, the the US has been has been a fairly uh, straightforward um, market for us to enter, particularly as a as a British brand. Um, Emily, you're nodding the way there. Uh quite vigorously. Did you want to add to that at all? Or, or well, I'm happy to move on if... No, no, it was, um, it was really interesting to hear Laura's experiences um, and she just so exemplifies everything we try and get uh, people who go through the Export Academy to do in terms of the focus that she brings to things, focusing in terms of products, focusing in terms of place, and then just nailing it when you're doing it. Um, so that that is the model everybody should be adopting. Brilliant. Um, my next question, um, I might bring Irina in on this, is about sort of, uh, um, sort of language and cultural differences. And we had hoped to have Paul here as well, who is a polyglot, speaks many languages to, to chip in on this conversation. But unfortunately, still here. Right. are you still here? So, so make sure feel, here. Free to, feel free to pipe up if you need. But Irina, I'll come to you first. What sort of things uh, should brands be mindful of when it comes to you know, uh, exporting and the cultural differences and the language issues. Yeah, absolutely. That is a very valid point. Um, and I think we highlight that quite strongly as we uh, speak about market research on Expert Academy program. Um, obviously, there are different types of cultures. Uh, we speak about transactional business culture and business etiquette. Uh, we speak about relationship uh, uh, business etiquette and it, it could be uh, it could vary from country to country uh, even if you look at European partners uh, you might look at let's say northern Europe European um, countries uh, and they will be more kind of a flexible more sort of um, uh, kind of a fast uh, work on kind of uh, achieving uh, mutual understanding really and if you look at some kind of southern uh, European countries they would be more focusing on hierarchy more like uh, um, relationship culture so and obviously that will differ from country to country and uh, it's absolutely paramount to learn uh, about cultural um, aspects cultural uh, considerations as you go to new markets and it's important to understand what's in, what what is vital for your client research that and uh, uh, that will prepare your uh, yourself uh, in terms of uh, how your product is perceived what are the expectations from your uh, products uh, and what the, the clients uh, 
client wants. Um, speaking about market research, I love this example. I think uh, Emily worked with a company. Uh, it's not exactly a fashion company, but it was a producer of uh, baby products, wasn't it, Emily? They've been uh, doing their research uh, for South Korea, and they've re realized through that, that 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 the white color is the symbol of death, uh, something which actually uh, made company to realize that they, they, they wouldn't be able to sell the products um, in white color in that market. So this is how important that is. And I think Laura highlighted just uh, now the cultural um, kind of proximity with English speaking markets, uh, just coming on language aspect now, uh, which I think is highly important, especially as you start uh, your expert venture. Um, so speaking the language gives you that kind of golden ticket. That's, that, that's very, very good. Uh, but at the same time, do not overestimate that. Uh, there is another good example um, I've learned from one of the expert champions who was selling uh, some foodstuffs into uh, US market and uh, the packaging, which was going into English speaking environment, uh, had flavor spelled in a um, uh, British way with U letter in it, uh, which was perceived as a spelling mistake for, for an American consumer, and they had to change the packaging. So it, it is very important to consider all these factors before, uh, before you uh, explore new markets. Um, I don't know if Emily or Irina wants to respond to Habib in the chat box. He's just asking, are there any bodies or organizations in the US that help enter the US market as a foreign brand? I don't know if you've got... A a link you can send to him or maybe perhaps get him to speak to you too first is that would that be the best thing to do or yeah what uh, what I, I would suggest doing as a first port of call is to get in touch with your local um dit office and i'll put a little link in the chat box for that um because it might be that there are local um uh, you know personnel who can kind of help you um getting into the u.s markets um, continue on the mail. Was, sorry, oh, sorry, sorry, sorry and my apologies because I'm I'm standing in the street, so I can't quite <laughs> see what's going on. Um, I was just going to say they're also picking up on Arena's point. There are a very important business cultural differences between the UK and the US, in particular for wholesale companies. So most companies that are selling on a wholesale basis, for example would normally expect a Japanese or a European customer to give them a deposit. Americans don't do deposits. So if your business model is predicated on you being able to ask for a customer to give you a 30% deposit, for example, then the US is going to be very difficult. Um, and Irina's point about the business culture is also very important in terms of payment terms, because um, in the UK, as a lot of people will know, and parts of Southern Europe and the United States, buyers don't always uh, like to settle their bills quite as quickly as they might do in Japan, for example. So th those are all areas of, of business culture, I would say. Um, there are other ones, you know, Japanese are always on time, always respond within 24 hours of an email. The Koreans we might assume are the same, but actually they're completely different. They may take a week to respond to an email. They're probably always going to be late for a meeting. So one of the, one of the challenges that we always find is perhaps less of a linguistic cultural barrier than a use of English barrier, which is always very important. And I think Irina was right, right when she said, don't overestimate uh, your your customer's ability to understand spoken English in particular, they're probably more likely to understand written English as long as it's fairly standardized. So, so that is, a, I think, a very important point. I've come into all sorts of problems over my life with the wrong term or a colloquial expression being used out of place, which my opposite number hasn't understood. On... That note, then, um, would it make sense? Because um, I have to say, in the fashion industry, I've seen some shocking mistakes <laughs> of things being misunderstood and mis designs, particularly. I've seen brands put out the wrong designs that have been massively culturally unsensitive and stuff like that. I won't go into any names or details at the moment, but would it make sense to sort of focus? initially for British brands on the Anglosphere. I'll come to either Paul or Irina on that. I, I don't know who would like to pick that up. Would it make sense initially to focus on those markets, US, Canada, Australia, etc.? 
Yeah, I, I can start. Yeah, I completely agree. I think that's the general advice we give to new exporters as they join the program is to concentrate on those uh, markets w w with whom we are culturally and geographically um, are in kind of proximity. That's the easy, uh, easiest, I think, way to, to start. Uh, obviously, lots of companies, as they uh, think of exporting, they look at large economies, India, China, US, um, which could be a challenge for a new exporter because obviously you will be uh, navigating uh, yeah, distance, uh, potentially, yeah, uh, big difference, uh, as we say, um, and it could present lots of lots of difficulties, even speaking about the time zones, you know, you might realize quite soon that, you know, when it's uh, daylight for you or you wake up in the morning, that's kind of uh, middle of the night for your partners. So that's uh, a very important consider consideration as you start, because you might not have resources, you know, to actually uh, cover that at early, early days. Um, yeah, I don't know if... Uh, Paul has anything to add. So we normally recommend, yeah, sort of uh, European uh, markets to start with, which are culturally and geographically close. Thank you. I think certainly from our side, we tend to start companies off at trade show level because UK Fashion and Textile Association does a number of different things, but one of them is to work with the Department for International Trade and separately with key international trade shows. Again, this is for wholesale companies. And most of those, I think it's something like 86% of all trade show activity in the fashion sector is in France, Germany and Italy. So, so the vast majority of those companies will not go off to a trade show in Japan, for example, but they would go to a trade show um in in paris florence milan for example and that's generally the advice and we we give companies one-to-one -one advice on behalf of dit um and, and separately again for our members to sort of help companies to understand how that works interestingly if i look at the key the companies that we take to some of our key international events they're going to paris to sell to the japanese and the americans and the koreans they will sell to the european union but of course Brexit, and somebody had to mention that word on this call, has made life a lot more difficult. Um, you know, there is now a hard border between the UK and the EU, which needs to be navigated very carefully, both from a duty point of view and also a VAT point of view. So companies we're seeing on a business to consumer basis that we work with are often switching off their direct to consumer sales to the EU but still looking to see if they can develop their wholesale sales into the EU. So it is, I think it is start closer to home if you possibly can um, work with customers and countries which share our values, if you possibly can. I think that's important um, and, and we'll do our very best to try and demystify that. The labelling side for garment companies can be quite complicated and I know we've spent a lot of time at UKFT explaining to companies which fibre content labels in which language need to go on which label um, and also accessing things like, for example, the Genetex Care symbol licence which companies using those symbols need to have before they can uh, before they can actually use them. And incidentally, those symbols are different in the United States and Korea, for example, compared to the ones that we would use in Europe. So there, there's the compliance issues, which are always a little bit complicated, and the general, how do you get in front of a key buyer? But most key buyers travel to the European trade shows. Thanks, Paul. Um, okay, I've got a few questions for you, Laura, of Habib. I was just going to suggest, Habib, if you are around at three o'clock, we will be having a little bit of a breakout session. Uh, keep an eye out for Link. You're more than welcome to come in there and, and have a quick chat. Laura, you'll be around for a yeah. short while after this, yeah, if you've got any other burning questions. I want to come to Emily next because I did want you to talk briefly about international trade finance. Uh, can you just give us a brief overview on that, please? Yeah, well, the first thing to say is that we do run um, an hour long session on this quite quite regularly on the Expo Academy. So uh, if once you register, we'll send you through the details when we when we schedule the next one. But I'll give you the sort of key highlights from that, which is, um, you know, think about um, who could potentially provide you with um, a grant or, or, or a bit of um, financial assistance. So you've got uh, the Department for International Trade. Um, we're just coming to the end of something called the Internationalization Fund, which was um, uh, providing help and, and sort of match funding with, with companies seeking international markets. 
anybody would be a little bit late for that now, um, but um, we are waiting to hear uh, what, what kinds of support we'll have um, after, uh, after April um, that, that can help businesses. There's always um, different bits and pieces that are going on to, to, to help um, support companies. Um, I'm gonna put a link actually into, um, into the chat in just a moment where you can look up and see what kinds of um, grants and subsidies are, are available for your business in your area. Because bear in mind, your um, local enterprise partnership, LEPS, um, they sometimes have different um, grant pots. Um, your local growth hub might have a different grant pot, your local council. So it depends where you are in the UK, depends on your sector, depends on your size as to whether you're eligible and all those kinds of bits and pieces. Um, but it's always worth um, having a bit of a look around to see what um, is available to you. There's also, um, if you're doing anything new, I, and I see somebody's got um, a really interesting business with um, uh, garments for people with dementia, which sounds really interesting, it sounds really innovative. So you might want to think about something like Innovate UK, whether they've got anything um, that can that can help you. Um, they, they've got a couple of different programs. Um, and one of the programs that Innovate uh, UK run is called um, Pitch Fest. I think it's still running where what they will um, what they can do is help you identify um, uh, potential sources of, of, of financing and, um, and making really good um, pitches and attracting investment. Um, so there's lots of different schemes like that. Um, in terms of uh, loans, you can also think about approaching uh, British Business Bank. Um, they also run training sessions and things like that. So always worth upskilling yourself on these bits and pieces. It can pay off so much in the future if you um, if you do your homework there too. Um, and then if you are struggling to obtain a loan from your bank because you want to finance um, production for export, you can also think about UK export finance. So they don't lend to you directly, but what they can do is act as your guarantor with your bank um, to make the bank your bank a little bit more comfortable um, lending you some, some money for, for production. So I will pop in a couple of links into the chat there and uh, do feel free to, um, uh, uh, to, to, to look into that, get in touch with us. Um, it's, a, it's a big topic. Thanks. Thank you very much. Um, I am absolutely dreading this next question. Um, I'm going to open this up to the floor, whoever wants to respond to this. Uh, EU v non-EU transit tips and documentation. Who'd like to have a, a brief overview on that? <laughs> Who wants to pipe up first? Laura? Well, I, I, I'm, not going to, I'm not going to pipe up here. I, I, I think, uh, I think uh, Paul, Simon and Laura will be, uh, will be great <laughs> on this. But I've got another question to add, um, okay. just because I know that it's, uh, it's a big topic for, for, um, for retail. How are you managing with things like returns? Because that's always a challenge when you're exporting. We've got a bit of an expectation that we can return our clothes. Um, so how, how do you guys recommend dealing with that? Do you want to go first, Laura? Or... Yeah. So, okay. So, with this is this is such a good question because obviously everything everything just just changed, didn't it? Um, as as of Brexit, and we were promised amazing trade deals, and actually the trade deals are are quite um uh, tricky to navigate in some respects, and and it's super complex. For us, as a relatively new brand, um, we. We decided, and there are two parts to our business. So we've got our D2C part of our business, which is our e-com part of the business. As soon as Brexit happened and we realized how tricky it was to get goods overseas, and more importantly, to Emily's point, get them returned to us, we essentially turned off our advertising across the EU because we weren't so interested in generating sales there. It was just going to be too expensive. Um, and we we sort of spent that budget more in the USA and, and also in Asia as well. Since then, um, returns have been a little bit easier coming through back through Europe because the, um, as I understand it, sort of the, 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 les the legislation has sort of settled somewhat. The customs clearance has become a bit, a bit easier. Um, and we certainly on our D to C sales, um, uh, our customers, as long as they're returning goods to us, I think it's within three months. Um, we don't get stung with um, uh, import duty on the way back in. I think we still get that. I can't remember, but it's not it's not so much of a 
so much of a problem. Um, so D 2 C is kind of okay for us. On the wholesale front, so we're we're just doing a wholesale deal with um, with a a huge German retailer at the moment, which is very exciting. Um, and we are just, again, figuring out our returns with them and our inco, um, our inco terms there. Um, but it's, it, it, it's very difficult. And what we're trying to do is get a warehouse sorted within the EU so that if there are any, any sort of returns from them, they can, be, they can stay within the EU and potentially go out to another another sort of EU retailer. But yeah, it's kind of a we we're gonna have to get a, a, a warehouse within within the EU to help us um negate those extra costs. Um Simon, have you got anything to add on this? <clears throat> um much the same as Laura really. I think I think also just to just to make a footnote, sorry I've got a cat here. Sorry about that. He wants to get on the show. Um a footnote is Laura's, I love Laura's business. It, it's definitely in the luxury area in terms of price points. And I noticed a lot of people in the audience potentially watching this are more in maybe not that area of pricing. So that, you know, fast fashion or medium term fashion, that, that's another factor that you have to consider because especially around the whole question of returns, because if there's a cost of returns and you're sending, I don't know, a a 50 pound garment into the US or to the EU, you know, 50 pounds retail price isn't going to cover the cost of the return. So it, you know, you need, you really need to decide whoever you are on this call, what, which bracket you fit in, because some markets are going to be closed to you based on your price points. Um, but as, you know, as Laura said, you I mean, I, I work with some businesses um, and, you know, Brexit has just finished. It's just finished them in France and Germany overnight. They're not, they're not doing it anymore, which is really sad for them. What they are looking at now is where, where they did have quite a considerable, considerable business before Brexit. You know, they are looking at third, third party logistics partners uh, to work within those markets. They're looking at where their products are made. Um, and if they have a deal with somebody in Germany or France, they're looking at clever ways to drop the product into uh, like Rotterdam potentially. So, you know, you, you don't, this idea of bringing stock to the UK and then having to re-export it, it's, it's absolutely impossible. I, I'd just say it's a non-starter really. So well, I think one of the, the, the non-negotiables that you need to think about is, you know, who you are, what price bracket or what part of the market you sit in and how, you know, how agile can you be in terms of your supply chain to actually, you know, if, if Europe is a market for you, how agile can you be to actually get your product directly into Europe as opposed to bringing it into the UK, really? You know, instead of sort of saying, oh, we're doing really well in the UK, we now need to sell into all of these different markets. You just need to do a little bit of, um, you know, moving the chess pieces around the board, as I call it, um, to work out whether it's really the right opportunity for you. I can see Paul itching to come in here. Do you want to just add briefly, Paul, if you can? Just add to yes, it. absolutely. No, I was just going to say, your previous <laughs> two speakers, Simon and Laura, have covered it very well. And across the industry, we've seen lots of companies on a D2C basis switch off their sales into the EU because it was costing them substantially more to get them back than it was actually um, going to bring them in terms of money. So it became unprofitable. And I think Laura said, and I, and I think this is also true, that there has been some settling down of the situation. There's now a little bit more competition between some of the so-called fast parcel services. So you, you're beginning to see things settle down, but the, the long-term issues around Brexit are still very much as Simon has painted the picture, that it is very difficult to get goods across the border. So we are certainly from UKFT's point of view, working quite closely with a lot of companies that are now setting up EU-based uh, VAT companies so that they can bring the goods um, from Portugal, Spain, wherever they may be manufactured and distribute from there. That's not different in some ways to what a lot of our companies do in the United States, for example. So, you know, if you're, you, you have to think very carefully about where your product production is coming from and where your customer is based and make sure that those things are aligned as much as you possibly can. 
I think the other issue that we find, um, particularly with Brexit, and my apologies, my, uh, my, my battery now seems to be running out. I'm having a really good day today, as you can see. Uh, thankfully, the building hasn't blown up yet. I'm looking at it, it's still there. But um, is, is sort of on the paperwork side for the returns. And there are, if you're using a fast, uh, fast track shipment to send goods out, you can sometimes substitute those goods on a duty-free basis if you get the paperwork right. So always talk to your shipper, um, seek specialist support if you need it to try and make that easier because sometimes the fast track companies can actually, the parcel companies can actually sort out some of these problems quietly in the background, but they need to be spoken to in a very, in a very specific way in order for that to happen. But it is quite challenging at the moment. And of course, the challenge for us is having found that the EU market is so complicated, which other markets will make up the difference. And the US has been said before, Japan, certainly from my side, Korea have been the markets that most of our companies have looked to to make up shortfall. Oh, you must be absolutely freezing out there. I really appreciate you really cold out here. <laughs> going through this. For, we're not much longer, so, so don't worry. Um, speaking of time, actually, I, I just want to move on. I want to talk briefly. I want to bring uh, Arena back in on this. Trade missions. Do you want to just give a quick uh, overview of how trade missions might be able to help Arena? Yeah, thank you, Dale. Uh, it's one of the kind of all also core services we provide this Department for International Trade. Uh, trade missions are yeah basically a delegation of businesses who are visiting um, uh, a market of uh, your interest, interest of, you know for you for you to export into. Um, Trade missions can be organized around a particular sector, they can cover a particular trade show um, and or they can be cross sectoral, they can include companies uh, across various various sectors. And I think the beauty of taking part in uh, trade missions um, with DIT, with Department for International Trade, um, is because we provide that element of sort of uh, your record. So before you go to the market, we um, help with that research element. We normally work with some um, sort of uh, on the ground parties. It's either some chambers of commerce who do that research for us or um, uh, professional um, market research companies. Um, there, there's a selection process attached to this. Uh, normally companies are uh, provide, provide the, the information about themselves, uh, the, the, the profile of their uh, products. Um, and there is kind of assessment which takes place uh, and we do the sort of uh, pre-selection pre exercise. So we'll look at the uh, how successful the product can be in the market. If the market is saturated with that product, for instance, we recommend not to travel. We recommend to not to waste your resources, your time and not take part in the trade mission. Um, but but generally speaking, speaking, it's a very useful uh, method of your field research your sort of um, primary data collection because you come out to the market and you visit your potential partners we normally provide um guaranteed i think three meetings you know that that's the standard uh, how missions work um and uh, you can visit your potential distributors, your agents uh, or buyers um, as you arrive to the market. So it's, it's a bit of a kind of handholding we provide as well. We help with the logistical side. Um, we do charge a little bit. It's a, it's a subsidized service. So you, you pay for your accommodation, you pay for your travel, uh, but, but we just charge a symbolic charge of 50, 60 pounds so that companies enroll uh, and we organize the entire program for you. So it's an easy way to visit the market and it's an, an easy way to uh, find some partners. I do love a good trade mission, I have to say. <laughs> have you, sorry, have you not? I, I do love a good trade mission. In, oh, sorry, of course, yeah, trade. yeah, yeah. <laughs> the ones I've been on in the past, that is. Um, going to move on to Laura and Simon then because I'm just conscious of time um uh just want to talk a little bit more about controlling your supply chain uh with respect to who'd like to pick that up um any tips on how best to sort of control your supply chain Simon um just define what you mean by control well in terms of bringing products in out you know sort of yeah. um yeah. Well, look. The, 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 I think the, the the heading of the meeting today is 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 exporting. Or you ready? To, are you ready to export? I mean, in its purest form, exporting to me says you know it's something that's that's here. It's been made, and it's a British brand, and it and it goes it gets sent off to a market. But in actual fact, you know, there's there's very few 
even British brands that actually are made in the UK. So, mm. you know, um, you know, it's actually a case of re-exporting something else that has arrived here from somewhere else, which is that's a whole different ball game, really. So, um, you know, I, I think I think a good example is um, especially if you're looking at the US as a as a market. There's certain countries out there, uh, definitely in the African region, for example, where they have duty free access into the US. So, you know, I know that I know companies at the moment that are shifting production into Egypt, for example. Um, and the reason they're shifting production into Egypt is because um, it's duty free into the US, which is, mm. just, you know, it's it's just brilliant. If you've got, you know, an existing supply chain potentially in India, um, I'm not a hundred percent sure. I'm not a I'm not a an expert in supply chain, but I I, I believe that there are some challenges around um, product that originates in India being being easily exported into the US, for example. But there are there are agencies and bodies out there that can ad, can advise you know companies on this more specifically. I think the, the the I just made a note when you were talking before as well. Um, one of the other non-negotiables that you, you you have to consider is is uh, getting some good tax advice as well. Um, I know I've had onerous experiences trying to export into Canada before. It's a very difficult market for all fashion. Um, the US as well. You know, you need you need a good tax lawyer to advise you on the do's and don'ts in that market. Uh, not so much Australia necessarily, but when we were talking about those Anglo type of markets, um, you know, they're, 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 that's that's something else that I don't add on to the list of, you know, non-negotiables that you need to consider into those markets. Um, but, you know, there, there, are, there are, there are, I mean, I'm sure DIT can support the businesses through their US colleagues to find out where these, these duty-free country of origin markets are um you you guys probably know better than me right i i just know that there's there's a lot of countries in africa at the moment that have this easy access into the us and and I, actually I, I just want to jump in there um because again i'm thinking of the poll at the beginning where 88 percent of people on the on the line are, are totally new to this and as someone myself who was totally new to this. I'm probably the least experienced person on this call because I, I hadn't exported anything up until about two years ago. Um, uh, I know that this, we're, we're sort of talking about quite things that sound very, very complex, um, uh, potentially a bit scary. That's certainly how I felt about exporting and, and you know, how, how to sort of manage this unwieldy global supply chain. Um, but it, it is doable and it's it, it's one of these things where I, I really would encourage people to do the Export Academy because it's gonna help you understand how to navigate a supply chain or build a supply chain that's specific to you, your product, your objectives, your price point, um, uh, your, your, your sort of global positioning. Um, so I'd really, I, I would really encourage you just to get some basic knowledge and then you will be able to start build a picture, building a picture um, and thinking about what, as I said, what markets are right for you, what, what trade deals you can take advantage of. You can start to think about things like de minimis values, which we haven't touched on, but are the point at which um, at the threshold at which duty is charged, for instance, within a country in the US, the de minimis threshold is really high. It's eight hundred dollars. So if you've got a D to C business, you could essentially be sending stuff D to C um, uh, straight to your customer in the US without duty free. Um, so yeah, I would I I, uh, I I would strongly encourage you to to sign up for the Export Academy and to start to build out a plan that is specific to you. Um, and your business. I think that's really important. Thanks, Laura. Um, unless anybody else has got anything else to say, I'm going to just sort of, sort of get to our last five minutes of top tips, top takeaways, if that's okay. Um, we've lost Paul now, so huge thank you to Paul for, for her braving this. He's got over a lot of challenges to get on this webinar today. Um, so 
uh, before I do, I'm just going to ask my colleague Mia just to pop in the chat box a link to our debrief meeting after this. So if anybody, there's been a few questions uh, asked that we've not been able to answer. So if anybody wants to join us there, it's just a standard Zoom meeting and you'll have an opportunity to maybe exchange some emails and ask a few questions that we perhaps haven't done in this. But I'd just like to go right around the panel if that's okay. Um, I don't know who wants to pick up first. Maybe Emily, you're, you're, you're on the corner of my screen. Just a few things if that you'd like the audience to not, you know, a few things you want them to go away with today without, you know, if there's three things you want them to remember, what would you say? Oh, gosh, it's whether I can remember three things, that's the issue. <laughs> well, it doesn't um, have to be three things, the key things, <laughs> well, the non-negotiables, as Simon says. Um, first and foremost, join the Export Academy because we'll, we'll take you through all of the nuts and bolts. It doesn't need to be intimidating. We'll break it all down. As Laura says, it is exporting for dummies. So, so come along and we can help you with that. Um, the second thing would be um, uh, the thing that Laura has exemplified so well, which is be really focused, make time for it, do your homework, um, uh, figure out what you're doing and then do it in a, in a sort of coherent way. And then um, finally, I think something to mention as we are part of the fashion network, my sort of personal top tip is people don't make use of networks enough. So um, organizations like you guys, um, being able to get in touch with people like Paul and Simon and Laura and pick their brains um, because they've been on this journey, they know what they're doing. They've probably um, made the mistakes and learned the lessons and they can just give you the shortcuts and all that kind of stuff. Um, speak to people, really um, understand where people have been and, and how they can sort of um, uh, add value. And people are really, really helpful. Um, they like to share their experiences experiences there um uh, it, it's a it's a really nice way to, to to understand what you're doing thank you uh, emily and thanks for the plug there really actually just to let everybody know simon and i actually run a forum called the board you can't afford forum where we bring lots of sort of like senior level executives in to sort of just help and it's like a bit of an investment forum so anyway we're not here to plug that but um irena come to you next a few things not to forget uh, from this webinar yeah, absolutely. Just to add to uh, completely agree with whatever Emily said, Export Academy first, uh, of course. Um, and it's free, yeah. isn't it? It's free, it's free, uh, isn't yeah, it's a pretty, absolutely free uh, program. Yep. Uh, and everybody can join it regardless of the size, turnover, you know, sector. But uh, I think I would also highlight the importance of market research for companies. Uh, that's something which we speak a lot on Expert Academy. And there are so many things because I think the industry of fashion and textile is, uh, is quite a global uh, uh, global industry because a lot of things come from different countries so it's it's a very sort of uh, much integrated industry into international trade anyway um so there, there are a lot of things you need to look at and uh, you have to do your homework really really thoroughly in terms of uh, the market selection uh, product modification you might need to do um you know legal framework you know your um, compliance uh with customs you know we highlighted a few things already um and we didn't touch upon this today but obviously sustainable fashion is another big thing which is mm. uh, evolving uh very rapidly at the moment there's a big trend so probably for new exporters if you are looking at uh european markets probably try to look at some directives which are in place some um some kind of uh you know manuals what what you need to comply with look at you know bigger players big retailers what do they do in terms of uh in, in terms of sustainable fashion so it's a, probably a completely different uh topic uh but just to highlight as well we've mentioned free trade agreements a few times uh today uh, and the expert academy runs um I think it's twice a month now we run sort of um, uh, an overview of free trade agreements how to understand them how to look for information uh, across uh, free trade agreements uh, obviously we've got tca uh, trade and cooperation agreement with uh, europe so probably it's worth also looking at our calendar back to expert academy again and just probably having a look at uh, those uh, webinars as well thank, thank you, you so much uh, come to you next simon what your one two three things not to forget from this webinar if you can sum it up um i think if you know and laura is a really good example if if you have um a really great idea um and a really strong brand that has a real usp um and if you think it's you know it's right for an individual market um, a bit like Irina said you know do your research if you think your brand is right and the usp is there then explore it do it you know because you know exporting or selling your product products in international markets is 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 a great experience um and it's a, it's a great way to grow your business i think um 
I think if if there is, you know, we've only spoken really here today about maybe we, we've mentioned wholesale a lot and we've mentioned direct to customer, but you know, there's other avenues as well. Um, if you have a if you have a really unique brand, it could be it, in the US, it could be something like licensing as well, um, which is a great way to have a have an a, an American partner. Um, it cuts out a lot of the potential barriers that we may have covered off today. And it, it, it can be um, a great way to drive revenue for your business. So, um, I, you know, I hope, I hope none of us have said stuff that has been too scary today. I think overall exporting and getting into international markets is, is great for any business, but just be careful and, and make sure that you've, you've got all of your, uh, all of your ducks lined up, as they say in the North. Laura, you can have the last words. Right. Um, so the first thing is just sign up for the Export Academy. It's free. It's brilliant. It's easy. And it will, you know, it will just demystify this whole potentially scary area into something that's that's totally doable and really exciting. And, and actually, the second thing, building on Simon's brilliant point there about licensing. In, in due course, once you've decided that you do want to start exporting, maybe even before then, do you check your trademarks? And again, I know that we've touched on this, but you need to ensure that your brand name and potentially your designs are, are going to be protected and actually aren't infringing other people's in other markets. Otherwise, you could get into some hot water fairly quickly. Um, and if you do want to, to, to license your brand name, you will need a trademark in that specific country. So for instance, you need a trademark in the US. There's no such thing as a global trademark, I'm afraid. Um, you do Ha, tend to have to seek trademarks um, sort of per, per territory. Have a chat with the IPO, who are the Intellectual Property Office um, here, here in the UK. Again, the DIT can help you connect with them, but just have a chat and then you can start to build out and think about your, um, uh, your trademarking and your intellectual property, because that is a key, key part of going global. Thank you, Laura. Um, thank you all of you, actually, um, and thanks to uh, UK Export Academy for supporting this session. What we're going to do is there's the link in there, if you can see, guys, just to if anybody in the audience wants to join us, you're more than welcome. We're only going to be there for about 10 to 15 minutes, but we will send an email around to everybody that's uh, in this session now and everyone who's registered to this session with a link to the Export uh, Academy, but also to the YouTube recording in case you want to listen to this again. So huge thank you to everybody. And I shall see you guys shortly in the other room, the other virtual room. So thank you very much, guys. Cheers. Thanks so much for hosting, Dale. Thank you. Thank you very Cheers. much. Bye-bye. Thanks a lot.